Let's go. Let's do it. Bring the energy, Gary. Come on. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Straight up. You know that scene in Friends when Ross goes, you are one confident guy. <laughs> Gary just gone, come on, Gary. Bring the energy. Bring the thunder. <laughs> Hi everybody, welcome to episode 73 of the Run the Hills podcast, sponsored by Chia Charge. 73, Eddie, that was the year I was born, glorious year, 1973. Oh, you are ancient. You know what else happened in 1973? Mm -hmm. Sunderland won the FA Cup. I've just been watching the English game on Netflix all about the FA Cup. Have you ever watched it? Oh, no, no. Really good. Really I'm good. not in love with football anymore, but... Uh... No, but it's not. It's all like how the professional amateur players, how the clubs came about. Yes. It's really good. It's really well acted. It's actors that are not Ooh. high profile, but they are actually Scottish and Northern because yeah. that drives Bryn and I mad when they put like an American trying to speak a Scottish accent on these Netflix films. Which puzzles me that. Um, I want, we, Which what? casting director goes, oh, yeah, that's oh, that's a brilliant accent. We must use that. Really, in, in either country, there is somebody that could do that role. The only, I would say, I don't know his name, but I'm. we're also watching Succession. Have you watched that? Oh, missed that one. And there's a British actor. He's really well known. He used to be in um, Spooks. He was like the main guy in Spooks. Okay. And he's playing an American, but he's really good. I actually think British actors are better at American accents than the other way around. Very interesting yeah. observation. Yeah, don't regress. <laughs> anyway. Hi, everybody. Hi. I've got to do the intro. I've got to finish the intro. Oh, <laughs> if you want to fuel your adventure with real food made with real ingredients, head over to www.chiacharge.co.uk. How's it going, Just watch your after because I've just eaten a protein bar. Yeah. <laughs> and now we're on Zoom and I'm like, oh dear, I've got a few bits in Cramming the Cramming it in. Cramming it in. Busy life. Yeah, I'm good. I've come back to life, Gary. Last week, I think we recorded it. Uh, I was getting there, wasn't I? But I still yeah. struggle to breathe in a bit. And my eyeballs. Um, but I pushed through. Coach was like, don't do too much. Don't do too much. And I went, yeah. uh-huh, yeah. uh-huh. Okay, I'm just going <laughs> to I'm gonna ignore that. And he kept going, don't you do, 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 do too much. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah, just another run. But um, I, I, felt, I felt okay. I actually felt better for taking taking air than staying yeah. inside i felt better for fresh air a bit of movement and so now i'm back i'm trying to <laughs> i just talked to my coach then and he was like let's just try and put a week because i was like so what am i gonna do this and what are we gonna do this and when i need i need to do this and i need to do this he's like let's just try and put a week together of training and tick yeah. all those boxes and then we'll go from there and i was like okay calm down <laughs> because like you know we've all been there like injury illness you get yep. the panic and you're like i need to go i've got you know i've got such a long way to go but you can't rush fitness uh, we've mentioned before that training plans are always designed to if you get to the whole if you do the whole plan and you've not had a niggle or an illness then wonderful but usually you do and they're long enough and if you've done them appropriately then yeah, you can cope with a little blip in your in your training. You've got to have a blip and just got to ride it out. And I think the thing with COVID as well is that you've got to, it takes you a little while, doesn't it, to come back and um, just, you've just got to be a bit careful. But I, I do feel like I'm back. I'm back living my life again. Yeah. Kids were all back at school. Oh my God, first day yesterday. <laughs> there was no one for a month because they broke up like middle of December. And there was no one in the house. Well, to be honest, I wasn't in the house much because I was like, I am out of here. Yeah, get out. And I just spent the whole day light exercising with various different friends I could find. <laughs> I've seen your Strava. I really love your Strava. You've got nice tight contours on your maps and mountains there. It's brilliant. I was like, right, okay, I can run down to the gym and meet you there, my one friend. And we did some, we lifted some weights that after each set, we had to like lean over the bench and be like, Oh, I honestly, I've not lifted that heavy where the last few reps I thought I'm going to need, a, I might puke. That's really, I was Ooh. like, never, I've never, never done that before, but it felt good. 
it felt good and it, when you're doing it with someone else as well it's more fun because yeah. you, see, you see the pain and then um and then so and then I ran back <clears throat> just time efficiency and nice little run and then uh and then i went skiing all day with my other got another mate <laughs> what are you doing come on let's go skiing. awesome uh uh so i was like i think that's i felt refreshed though not a lot happened at home as we just said no cleaning <laughs> but i'm kind of over the i mean the sun is shining on the floor right now and it's oh i don't like a sunny <laughs> a sunny room when you've not dusted <laughs> <laughs> and our house like because we have a fire is our, our source of heating our house is so dusty i just feel like i'm fighting a losing battle so i'm kind of like as long as everybody's got clean pants socks brush their teeth yeah and like the kitchen area is relatively clean let's just let's spend our time outside not with <laughs> jiff and a cloth anyway so there we are i'm alive that's why i'm chattering this week compared to last week when i was like oh yeah yes <laughs> <laughs> what uh what's news what's news your your neck you'd be surprised world. to hear i've been doing more 200s what? and 400s have you sent your splits to a leash yet go on look i'm catching you up now I i'm getting to 50 uh, interested in my me immortal splits we did it we did a it was quite good last week we did them and we had one two three four including me doing it so it was quite nice I was zigzagging back and forwards. You found oh, a little bit of well lit road. And the good thing with the children forwards when you just go back and forwards, I mentioned this before, it's a good social session because you're not progressively either leaving somebody behind or you're getting left behind. Um, so you are all together. And then we had a, I had a lime and soda afterwards, but this is our Thirsty Thursday crew. So that was nice. And the good thing, the place I found was slightly downhill which was good because you're running faster but maybe we were hitting our splits faster than um what the prescribed pace would be so the effort was probably the same but it was quite uplifting to be doing like say 10 seconds a mile 15 seconds a mile quicker so I enjoyed that and then instead of the other session I did the Sedgefield Harriers winter handicap on Sunday which is quite nice about a six mile trail race around a little village called Bishop Midland and Sedgefield and with the handicap, Eddie, you'll know this. There's there's bandits out there. They they tell you that. Oh, the sandbaggers. <laughs> and you see them because you all know each other, don't you? And you're like, uh. Yeah. Hello. With a handicap, we should all finish together. That's the. Never uh, happens. Never, never ever. ever happens. And you can see people's. Um, I was off a 21 minute handicap, I think. But yeah, yeah, yeah. I couldn't rein some people in. Uh, <laughs> And some people went past me quite early on. But I always treat, I always, <clears throat> I never race these things. I always treat them like a good, say, a threshold run. But it's wicked. I think people must think it's a catch. It's totally free. You can just rock up, turn, do this race for free. It's not like UK athletics or anything like that. You just turn up, race. <clears throat> but there's never usually loads of people there. And I think, what's the, you know, there's no medal. There's nothing like that. But uh, yeah, the numbers are quite low. But for a free trail race while maybe the following weekend people would quite unmerely pay 30 pound for a, a 10k yeah, somewhere else. There should else. be more stuff like this. There should be more. People yeah. Should do more I, stuff like this. So I did that. I did all my mobility. Super good. Did uh, lots of stretching. You did and, at like 10 to 9 at night. I know, yeah. It was, I really had to squeeze it in, but we did it all. Did the three sessions. Did a few hours on the moors on Sunday, um, which is quite nice with, with Adam and Neil. I enjoyed that. And out and back to Bloth, crossing and back. Any hard moors people will know that. Did Rexy location. go on that one? Pardon? Did Rexy go on that one? No, he didn't. He's not. He doesn't travel well. So, and then we finished off that recce with a nice little cheer charge white chalk and raspberry cheer charge protein bar. So I was very diligent. And then later on in the day, me and Rex shared a few miles down the Dean. So all in all, I think about seventy odd miles. Two Zwifts. I did a race. I think on Zwift as well. Uh, all my mobility. How did you find the race? Well, I didn't race it. I kept my kit. I was trying to work out what cadence I should be. Uh, I need to actually read what my cadence should be. So that was the goal. Keep my heart rate a certain rate based on um, cadence. Uh, so I didn't treat it as a race. But again, just drenched in sweat. It's unbelievable. Like, how sweaty you get on Zwift? <laughs> I've got some shorts for now. Really disgusting is I have my cycling shorts. And I just take them off and drape them over my bike and dry it. They I don't wash them every time, and then well, I'm I was... like, I'll, I'll be dry over the next time I go on my bike. 
<laughs> well, I was going to ask you, like, towel and kit etiquette on the bike, because it's not dirty. It seems quite wasteful to wash it every time. But Yeah, yeah well, I, what I do, what, where I have mine, I've, I've got a spare bit of carpet underneath the bike, so that catches the sweat, and then a towel covering, because you don't want... Um, uh, sweat to drip down into your stem on your bike because it can rust then the in Ooh. from the inside. So you want to okay. cover like the bike so you're not sweating on your bike too much. And then and then I just wear my shorts and a sports bra. Actually I normally start with like all the layers like I've got on now and then very quickly whip them yeah. off pretty quick. Yeah. And then I just dry it all off when I finish and then I just hang my shorts over the um over the handlebar because it's in a back room so it's not in a public place so nobody yeah. goes where I do it. And then uh, and then I just use the towel again until it's and then eventually the shorts are so crusty I'm like oh, we'll have a fresh pair. But I only have one pair and I'm cycling shorts. So I mean it's pretty minging isn't it but um that's life. It's only yeah. sweat. But it was really good to use that time. And I listened to the podcast before it went live on Friday. So multitasking. And uh, that, that's for me, you know. I want to listen, to, I want to watch um, Ricky Gervais's new Afterlife series. And the family aren't that keen on that. Yeah, so. it's a great way of watching stuff that nobody else yeah, yeah. wants to watch. So pretty good. Can't complain with that week. Race results this week. Well, there was really only one race that uh, the whole of the UK were watching, which was the Spine Race, um, held over the Pennine Way, 268 miles. If you weren't not watching this time, make sure you are next time. You get super invested in random people that you don't know very much. Um, but the female winner, Debbie Martin Kansani. Did you see her finish? Yeah, she was like oh, 45 oh, degrees. Okay. That's so hardcore. Oh my God. And she'd said that she thought she was running really straight. She's like, I'm <laughs> I'd never seen that phenomenon until I'd started running ultras. And I think after the Hormones 110 one year, a friend of mine came in and she was like listing to the side. And Damien Hall, after his coast to coast. Yeah, I've seen it a lot in 24 hour track races where people slowly start. To... Anyway, Ian Keith was. Uh, First place male in 92 hours, 40 minutes, 30 seconds. Um, kudos, I mean, the, the, those guys, amazing on their wins. Kudos to anybody who finished that right yeah. from the winners to the back of the pack. I loved, I loved it when they did Facebook Lives and you watch people finish and I'd start, I just <laughs> cry. I mean, I watched Debbie's about four times, just weeping, yeah. going, oh my God, that emotion at the finish. And I've had so many people message going, I want to do the spine, I want to do the spine. What a release of emotions they have to do in that. Did I think he on the way, he just, like, when everyone went shooting off, he was like, yeah, 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 you do your thing. Oh. Well, this is it. He knew it. He was like, I play the long game. I play the long game. I'm not going to beat you by uh, speed. I'm going to beat you by my mm, determination, my mountain yeah. skills. Looking after your, himself, basically. Yeah. That's what the spine is, isn't it? That it's, um, it's self-management, taking out the ego. The inner mm. chimp, wasn't it? I think Kim Collison said, how'd you quieten the inner chimp? And a big well done also to former guest of the show, Dougie Zinnis, joint second with James. Oh, how would you pronounce that? Leavesley? Yeah, Leavesley. Yeah, joint second. Awesome run there. Dougie and James. And also well done to a friend of mine, Rob Brooks. I've shared many a fell mile with Rob. And again, another one, I'll see him across country too. So he really doesn't mind six mile or 260 miles, <laughs> he said. And he's, you know, got to say, Rob's, uh, he's always got a patched up knee and stuff like that. So that would be a lot of doubt um, going into a big event, how it's going to hold out. And um, yeah, I'm really pleased it did hold out and he got the finish there. Well done, everybody. Brass Monkey Half Marathon. This, you're going for a PB, Eddie, and it's not a bad day. Okay. Okay. Everybody, everybody heads for the Brass Monkey. It is super, super popular. Um, if you're unfortunate, you know, it's a frosty winter's day, then obviously that's not great underfoot. There's brass Monkeys all around. Yeah, Brass Monkey, yeah. But uh, Kieran Walker, no, I, I've known Kieran Walker for, blimey, he must have been about 13 or something when I first met Kieran Walker. So he, he was really, really young athlete. And I'd see him, he lives pretty close to me, and I'd see this guy running around the trails and the paths and just think, oh, Who's that kid running around, yeah. running around? But he would always be like super fast. And to see him now evolving into this um, pretty accomplished athlete, you know, a 65 minute half marathon, that is, oh my goodness, me, I can't imagine the leg speed. And I saw there was a nice clip of him as he finished. Safe to see, he left everything out there. So 
Well done, Kieran. Took the win there. And Charlotte Mason for the ladies, 118 and 10 seconds. So two small compass times there. And our very own Tim Taylor crushing the two with the two hours and 59 seconds on his half marathon. And he did do a... <clears throat> I was really sensitive about this because we did the Hawker show and I uh, really wanted people to know it wasn't a sponsored show, you know, it wasn't anything like that. And then Tim posted a picture. He's just got some new hawkers. I'm thinking, oh, my goodness, everyone's thinking we're going to be lying about this. We're all dripping in hawker kits. I that think is... people know us well enough that we're not going <laughs> to... We're not going to tell Porky Five. You get fined out. Only need to ask Boris, don't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh wow, just, yes. Oh, just tell the comes truth. Out. It always comes out. People would find us. People would. Yeah, dripping in kit. But uh, yeah, well done, Tim. Good, great to see you out there. Two hours and fifty-nine seconds. That's brilliant. This week's guest is Russell Bentley, and it's a short first Edwina, a guest who was so good. They deserve two shows. It we had a great talk and talk and talk until we, we had a great chat with Russell. Another show, Russell. We get <laughs> your point. <laughs> but he had lots to say, and he said it really well. And you know, we didn't want to edit it all out into one show, so we thought we'd stretch it over two shows. The first show is more relating to his time in Kenya and his second place finish at the Dragons Back Race. Hope you enjoy it. Have like a, a, a tea machine or something that just bashes out tea really quick, or do you have to do a proper tea bag? Oh no, I've got this amazing kettle that keeps it hot. Oh, so we just wow. have to press the button and it just pops it up to boiling in like two oh, seconds. That's a good idea. So you just it was my a cup of tea. little treat. I was like, you know, I just I don't have time to wait for two minutes for kettle. Yeah, so yeah. It's ridiculous. It's oh, ridiculous, like but it is good when you're busy and you just need mm. a quick. Especially in the uh, winter. When you yeah, look on like up. 40 cups a day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, that's a good idea. I've got a pretty glass one where you can see the water boiling. Ooh. You see that? Oh, it's pretty. Yeah, it's yeah. Well, that is well yeah. fancy, Russell. Like that's way too fancy. Yeah, so you can look at it while it's boiling. It's just, boiling water where, is a pretty thing. Where do you stand on a on a cup of tea in a glass cup? I was telling no, my wife no. about this. No, no, oh. no. I don't like that. Hot things in That's ceramic. Common, hot things Gary. In That's common, Gary. That's very common. <laughs> I don't like, yeah, when you get a latte or a hot chocolate and, and it gets cold too quick as well. It doesn't hold the heat in. Good point. Uh, oh, no. Do you like it, Gary? <laughs> no, no, no. I don't. No, no, I don't. No, I, I didn't. I, it, uh, it, it's not really the nicest looking drink, a cup of tea. So you don't really want to yeah. see it from the side. Uh, Oh my Betty's god, face. a cup of tea, like <laughs> the uh oh, honestly, if I could have it on my pillow, I would picture of a cup of tea. We can keep all this in the podcast. People love the uh yeah, Twitter. Tea loopers. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, toilet break. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the show, Russell Bentley, who not only last year finished the 2021 Dragons Back, but just before Christmas set an unsupported FKT on the Paddy Buckley round, completing the arduous lap in 20 hours, 15 minutes and 47, 49 seconds. For those who don't know, the Paddy Buckley round is 47 summits throughout the 100k route for a total of about 28,000 feet of elevation gain. According to fastestknowntime.com, it was first completed by a woman in 1982 called Wendy Dobbs. Is that true, Russell? Yes, that's what I've heard. Um, I do get emails from the great man, Paddy Buckley himself, every now and then, and uh, he couldn't complete the rounds when he tried. I don't think he ever managed to, to actually finish the whole thing at the once. Uh, it was quite unusual, but Wendy Dodds <laughs> stepped up and decided to woman up and get the job done, and uh, she was the first one to go to go around it. This is a great bit of history. That, we need yeah. to find Wendy, Gary. We need to track her down. Yeah, and she's still around, yeah. Get her on the podcast. Anyway, awesome. thank you so much, Russell, for coming on the show. How are you? Where are you? And have you been for a run today? Hi, Eddie. Uh, hi, Gary. Yes, um, thanks for having me on the show. Big fan and love <laughs> all the other... Long time, long time fan. <clears throat> long time fan. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yes. I normally do check 
before I accept the podcast, to be honest with you, who else has been on? And if I don't recognize any of the names at all, <laughs> it's, it might just not be the right fit. But recognize everyone, big fan of all the guests you've had on before. So I was really excited to come on with you guys. And then listening to your stories as well. It sounds like you really know what you're talking about. You've been through it yourself. So that always makes it oh, a lot more important. kind of you to see. <laughs> I know. We've never had a guest like pay compliments <laughs> yeah. at the start. No, I What's he to after? Your, the pro. Yeah, I need He's some a... of that tear charge. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I... look, we can cut it. We can finish it now. <laughs> uh, <laughs> have you had time to go for a run today? We know we're catching you right when you've just done the school, uh, the school drop-off. So normally... This time of year in the winter, well, actually, all through the year, I wake up early and I get my run done early. One day that I do not do that is a Monday. I'm sorry. I am not available for anyone <laughs> on a Monday morning. Never have been. Doesn't work with me. Sunday long run is a part of that. Also, it's just a Monday morning and I just yeah. give myself the morning off. So it <laughs> always, everything it. feels harder on a Monday morning, doesn't hard. it? Just even the school run, just the getting up, the whining, yeah. the general finding shoes, oh, yeah. getting the pet lunch. It's All just... of it. Yeah. So I just give myself the Monday morning off. And... and would you run later on in the day or Monday is a complete rest day? No, I don't normally have a complete rest day. You know, Gary, when you're as fit as I am, you don't often need a full <laughs> rest day. A half a day get my head straight and then Monday evening and then we feel like I'm coming around and I can just about handle between five and 10 miles. Uh, in the winter, it's normally on the treadmill just because it's yeah. grim out there, raining and cold and dark. So that's what I'll probably be doing later. Whereabouts are you based, Russell? Hmm. So I live right in the middle of Snowdonia, but the town I live in actually isn't in Snowdonia. It's like a ring <laughs> donut. And inside of that ring donut, there is Blinder Fistini Oak. And it's high up town. It used to be a slate mining town. Yeah. And it's not actually part of the National Park, but we've got Snowdonia National Park all around us. So we can say Snowdonia. <laughs> yeah. Are you Welsh? Are your roots Welsh? So my wife, her dad is Welsh. And that was the only connection we had. And there was a holiday kind of home that um, is halfway up a mountain with no power no running water no heating no nothing no road and we used to go there uh, on a little holiday every year in november nina and i and um, we just fell in love with snowdonia doing that and we lived in different towns i lived in london she lived in oxford i've also spent a lot of time in kenya living in kenya and we realized we just didn't like city life she didn't want to move to London. I didn't want to move to Oxford. And one of us said, and we still can't remember who, why don't we just live in this house without any power or <laughs> water or Wi-Fi or anything in Snowdonia? And we just couldn't think of a good reason not to have a go. And that was how we ended up in Snowdonia. Now we've got kids. We don't still live in that house. But, oh. you know, yeah. <laughs> I was like, you've added power because we were on Wi-Fi. Yeah. Is that yeah. all you've Yeah, added? yeah, yeah. And maybe we've a added, drive to get the yeah. car there. Right, that's it. Now we live in the town, but we're not far away from that place. And um, that was really how it started. So our kids are Welsh. They speak fluent Welsh. Nina's job requires her to speak fluent Welsh. My Welsh is terrible, but I, I just have this excuse I'm hanging on to where I learned Swahili fluently. And now it's not really relevant anymore in my life and then so it's moving on to welsh and i'm like the two languages that, that i'll be able to speak are swahili and welsh <laughs> it's quite random uh, yeah it's I random know, but imagine if you found someone looking for a job for somebody that needed swahili and welsh yeah i mean you could ask for any money for that because you must be like you'd be the like only one want. in the world yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> what took you i'm curious it's not my next it shouldn't be my next question but what took you to kenya <laughs> oh man so Kenya was a big part of my life for a long time. Um, I first went out there in 2001 when I was 20, and I was on a gap year between um, you know, college and university. Um, and I was either going to go to Nepal because I love the mountains, or I was going to go to Kenya because I love running. And there was a, um, the, the prince of Nepal just killed the whole royal family or something. Okay. At that, in that year, I don't know if you remember, and um, so Nepal was just in like this lockdown of riots and like disarray. And my mum is Irish, and the 
main coats in Iten in Kenya where all the training happens is Irish. And so as you do, you just ring him up and say, um, I want my son to come and run with you. Is that okay? And he was like, yeah, sure. Like this legend of the sport, Brother Colin O'Connell. Uh, he went for it. And so before I knew it, I was on a plane to Kenya. At, I think I was 19 or 20. I uh, stayed there for three months the first time, and it just got its claws into me. I was back three times a year as much as I could. I've been there, I think, uh, a dozen times now. Yeah. Um, so I was running, and then I was running, and then starting a squad there and having a little business going. Uh, but I just I took Nina over there for six months, um, one year, and we were seriously considering living there full time. You know, it was, it was a place that I really loved. Um, but things like healthcare, yeah. things like education, you know, if you want to bring up a family there, they're just terrible. Yeah. And I thought it was all very well for me, having had a Western upbringing, to then move to Kenya. But if I did want to have kids, which I really did, um, would I be prepared to bring them up here in the Kenyan way? Because we didn't yeah. want to live like expats, you know, in a gated community. And we decided, no, <laughs> selfishly, we were going to bring up our kids in the Western world where we do have privileges and advantages yeah. that we're well aware of. Yeah. So I still got some close friends there, but um, no, Kenya, you know, I haven't been since 2016, but that's a brief overview. And is it quite um, international? You know, E10, e is there always lots of Westerners or not necessarily Westerners, Australian or people from the US? Yes. Now, E10 e is fully realized and you will see a lot of westerns whenever you go there fortunately for me i was really lucky in 2001 there was basically me and brother colin o'connell would be the only white people wow. in the whole of e10 so i was so lucky gary to get that experience when it was unique and yeah. it meant that because the kenyans was so new to seeing westerns they really would like take me as a prize and want to bring me to their homes and show me their family and it was a, a real um well win-win you know i got to see right into the heart of their community and yeah. and they got to show off a white guy which at the time was just so unusual yeah uh so i really got to get to know the kenyan culture and way of life and you know there's lessons there that i've learned that i'll keep with me forever friends that i've made and things that i've learned from there that i'm trying to bring back here now you know, yeah. lots of stuff that I think they do better uh, but yeah that was an incredible experience yeah and I had to obviously learn the language just to try and just to fit in a bit more and, and get to understand these people you know beautiful amazing people yeah that's fascinating now I must have done a good job because you Smoking fast on the road. I've been on power of 10 and I've done a bit of stalking. <laughs> Gary before was like, he's so fast, Eddie. He's so fast. He must be like the fastest person I've ever talked to. Well, no, no, I'm not. I mean, I've trained with world class, <clears throat> world record holders. Yeah. And but it's all relative. You know, like yeah. if you go to Kenya, a 30 minute 10K is just like run off at mill. You know, you will be finishing. I would say if it was a race, uh, I've done a few races in Kenya, across country, there might be a thousand. And if you get in the top half with a 30 minute 10K shape, you're, you're doing well. Like it was insane, That's good. insane the depth of talent there. So it's all relative. It was like free fitness in a way. You go yeah. there, you sit around the table with your mates, and they're all like 27, 28, 10K. They've all got cheek bones like chisels. Uh. <laughs> You get fitter just by being there. It's like osmosis. Yeah. You just suck it in. Yeah. I bet it's quite strange because I did a cross country race on uh, Saturday and I'm in the slow pack, but I definitely felt I was in the mix of the race. Um, but yeah, to be out there when, you know, 30 minute 10K is pretty standard. Average. It's, uh, I mean, I'm saying average to, to be kind to myself. <laughs> it's below average. It's the depth there in Kenya is unreal. You have to be there to believe it. And like, it's not like any other country in the world. Ethiopia yeah. doesn't have that kind of depth. So yeah, it was an eye opener when I first went and it takes a while to kind of assimilate because also they're born at high altitudes. Yeah. And so you have that against you as well. And the weather and the whole thing, the Kenyans, 
like the Kenyan national championship is the in cross country is the hardest race in the world, the hardest single race. And Harder than Dragon's Back. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to see a Kenyan on the Dragon's Back. That would be a dying wish of mine. I, would, I think that would be a brilliant thing to see. Yeah, Elliot Kipchoge doing Dragon's Back. <laughs> he would, did... He'd chuck his trainers off on the first climb. He'd be like, mm. <laughs> yeah, with his alpha fly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <He's over. laughs> <laughs> if you have a previous guest, you had some of these next percents, but they resold them to have a trail grip on them. I'm yeah, sure it's quite that common was... that, Carrie. I've got clients that do that yeah. and when they're doing like flat. Yeah, trail. yeah. So it's one of the reasons that I'm actually moving more into trail and fell is not a big fan of the super shoes. Got to put my hand out. I know you guys might like them, but. No. Personally, I uh, have a bit of I'm keeping my hands really. down. <laughs> it's fine. And I, I coach now, and a lot of athletes that I train, they wear them. So that's great, personal decision. But I'm from the old school, like minimalism and less is more kind of thing. And I just can't get with those big bouncy souls. The week after the race, I must admit, you don't feel as smashed up. Um, on the race yeah. day, I don't know if they make much difference, but the recovery is so much they more. They do. They pleasant. make a big difference. <laughs> Gary, you can't sandbag the fact that, oh, no, it's not the trainers, it's me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You hear that? Well, I, achi- I did achieve my, my only running goal was to run sub three, and I did it in super shoes and no super shoes. So yeah. I'll, I'll... All right. That's all right. great. All oh, right. good for you. That's you good. Does. <laughs> I would like to see more people do that. Yeah, if they want to back it up. I always oh, not the shoes, it's my hard training. That's fine. And just don't wear the shoes next time. Let's see how we go. <laughs> Yeah, see how you go. Could you chat to us a bit about your transition from the roads? Obviously, you know, a high level road athlete, but now probably safe to see you more of a mountain runner. Yeah, so the main reason Gary was locked down, and um, I remember my dad saying to me about um, have you heard of um, the rivalry between Chris Boardman and Graham Obrey? Oh, yeah, the so, hour. Uh, mm, that's it, exactly. It's good. Obrey used to make his own bicycles out of washing machines. It was like <laughs> old sick. school. And Chris Borman was into the science and yeah. inside the wind tunnels. And, everything. and I think Graham Obrey was just like, you know, just he would like to roll with the punches and go wherever the wind takes him and, you know, be open to new opportunities. And that was just trying to say to me at one point, you know, maybe you could be a bit more Graham Obrey and a bit less... Chris Borman, you know, because you're... <laughs> Is that a compliment? Quiet. I'm not sure. Um, I think he was trying to say, I've been trying to break this 30-minute barrier for the 10K, and I was banging my head against the wall, and it was getting worse, and I was getting more stressed about it. And he just mentioned this, and I was like, ah, what do you know? You know, that's a dude, to your parents. Yeah. And then lockdown happened, and I was like, yeah, I can't race. And there was no, like, uh, roadmap out of it. I was lined up for London Marathon. They didn't do a great job with their communication. Like we got cancelled last minute twice. Yeah. And then I was on the verge of, I wasn't near enough to the elite uh, London Marathon that they put okay. on. But, so I was really getting messed around. And for the first time in, in my entire life, I've been so lucky up to that point where I never really experienced depression. I didn't even know what that meant. I heard people talk about it, but it was like some abstract concept. And in that lockdown, I definitely got nearer to feeling that like I was, really, yeah. I put on weight. I had no, I had no goals. I had nothing to keep me running and the goals get you out of the door running. And then yeah. as a byproduct, you get all those benefits from running. And I just wasn't getting that. I was like looking at my screen in the, um, Zoom meetings and just not happy with what I saw. Yeah. So I found this Paddy Buckley round, and that was really when I started to shift massively from fell from road running to fell running, and I was like, that's going to need a lot of training to get that done. And there's just no way around it with the Paddy Buckley. You know, yeah. you need if you want to do it, you want to achieve it. You're going to have to get out there in the hills and get doing those recces. And it just transformed me more into a fell runner. And at the time, uh, it was the only gig in town. You know, there were no races on anyway. So yeah. I threw myself into that. And it's not like, oh, I've never looked back. You know, I'm on the track every week. And I've got some road races lined up. And I think it's good to have 
that repertoire, like you yeah. know, the, the toolkit, but the joy and the love that I've got for the mountains now, yeah, it just went through the roof and like yeah. to a level I never found on the roads. You know, a road marathon is much more, um, is it type B enjoyment? You know, you enjoy <laughs> it when you've done it. When it's yeah. over, you can enjoy it. I've uh, done London, Berlin, major marathons and you know, a great experience with the crowds and everything, and but it's painful and it's monotonous and it's, you can't really see anything. You're so yeah. far into your zone. But when you're out on the mountains of Snowdonia doing the Paddy Rocket, oh, it's, it's type one. You're, you're just loving it when you're out there. So definitely, yeah, my favorite type of running has become, um, has become the mountains. And I, I owe that to lockdown, really. I love the discovery. You can literally do... Uh... Mm -hmm. You can do do a see a section in the Bob Graham round ten times, and the next time you do it, you find a different line. Or Basically, it's like, yeah. where the hell did that come from? Yeah. Or, or you do it in reverse, yeah. and it opens up a whole new perspective to it. Yeah, and uh, actually, it's a good point that you make, Eric, because I'm about the only person in the world that goes anti-clockwise on the panic bucket, and I train with my mates clockwise because they're still, you know, they still think that's the way to go because everyone else goes that way. I'm convinced anti-clockwise is the best way. But a really great way of me making sure is going clockwise in my recce's. And you do get to see, yeah, new things, new lines. Yeah. One guy you're with does it a different way. And, you know, it's really like, oh, that was pretty good, actually. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's a part of the, yeah, the joy of it. It's, just, it's something completely unique to these rounds that you just don't get with road running. You know, the arrow says left, and you go left, and that's it. You don't have to think. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Can we talk a little bit now about how your training has changed from, um, because what one, I, I first, you came on my radar at Dragon's Back, but then I started uh, um, following you on Instagram and seeing this epic training that you do. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how your training has changed from your road running days? It's obviously quite a recent change. Um, mm. Uh, perhaps a little bit about how that road running training has influenced your mountain training as well. And perhaps there's also a sprinkling of Kenyan training in there as well. Mm. You don't have to share all your trade secrets, but a few would be quite nice. Oh, Eddie, you know, like that is the whole point of my existence now. It's just to try and share as much of it as possible. You know, no, no secrets. And I mean, as many people that are out there running that, you know, that's a win for everyone. So if I've got anything, I can show anyone at any point. I will. There are no, I don't have any secrets at all in my training. And it's massively influenced by the Kenyans. You know, they um they got to the top by this uh, for, by this desperation, you know, this poverty that they've been through, and they just started trying to make a living out of running. They have their uh, families with farms, so they're gonna be okay for food, lots of them, and they just through all their ability, all their talent at running, and they figured it out the hard way. They figured it all out the hard way. So if you see a Kenyan doing an easy run, jogging a 10 minute mileing, which they do, they're doing that because it works. They're not doing that for fun. They're not doing it because, you know, they're enjoying hanging out with their mates. They're doing it because this actually makes them a better run. And there's so much you can learn from their culture that we just not really open to. I've seen, UK athletic camps go to Kenya and they lock themselves in this compound and they come down to the track and there are like four or five Olympic medalists on the track at the time and they would look at what they're doing, they don't ask them any questions, they're just there like taking heart rate, taking blood lactate, not interested. Yeah. And Kenyans, the way they pass on knowledge is still very old school, like word to mouth. Um, sorry, a word of mouth and passing knowledge down. Um, so I don't know if they'll ever write a book, you know, Patrick Sang or Brother Colin McConnell. I don't know if we're ever going to get that out there because they're, they're so invested in, in their way of doing things. But the knowledge they have is just, it's enormous and it's very different and in lots of ways, very superior to, to the way we do things. And yeah, it's mainly, it's a lot of it. It's the easy one, you know, that would be the big difference. And it's something that, Strava and heart rate monitors have just stolen from us like so <laughs> brutally. Like every single run has to be, you know, monitored, it has to be on Strava, it has to be on yeah. the arm, and you have to log the 
the miles and yeah and that is a, that is a big difference and, it, and it's a western thing and it's hard to break out of when everyone around you is doing that but it's, it's definitely one of my main things you know and there are you know it's something that we did in the 80s when we were a dominant force um if you listen to steve jones you know the um who's uk marathon record holder for no fire well, yeah like, He's big into dropping the watch. I think they call it going naked, you know, just no technology, just running without earphones, without any watch, no idea, you know, just doing it for you. And that's something that I've found that I can do more on the hills because the terrain dictates that your pace, it can't matter as much yeah. anyway. So, that would be a big difference that I've introduced since I went to Kenya and, and then since I've been deciding, you know, I'm self-coached now and this has been going that way. I'm like, you know what, I don't I don't need the watch for this run. I'm gonna go for generally around an hour and I'm gonna go whatever the pace my body tells me to go. I can't out. imagine Steve Jones doing a 10 minute mile though, Russell. <laughs> no, no, no. He, you're right on that one, Gary. That's true. <laughs> he was quick, yeah, and it, quite an aggressive racer. But you know, I've seen um, I've seen the, the very best runners in the world rolling out of bed in the morning at six and just ten minute mining. They don't give a shit. Like they're yeah. just standing up straight, looking lovely, posture's all perfect, and they're just enjoying the birds singing in the dawn and and they're getting on and with their day and it's all part of their they're very sure of what they're doing. Yeah. So it's um it's something that I would really recommend. Like if it's like one thing I could recommend is just to just try like once a week just taking the watch off and going for that run. And it's like it's, it should be a really simple thing to say. Trying to get an athlete to do that just one <laughs> run a week it's crazy hard. Like, it's really hard to get. I think that's I, always, I, I always find it funny when people are like, I kept looking at my watch. I'm like, I don't look at my watch. The only time I look at my watch is to know that how long I've got till I've got to get home. Really. Yeah. I yeah. look at my watch. And go, how far can I push this? Yeah. Can I hear the sound of merry happiness at home, or <laughs> am I going to be greeted at the window with, oh, you've been out too long? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, that's <clears throat> true. Well, that, I mean, yeah. that's always a worry as well with Western lifestyles. Like, these Kenyans I'm talking about, yeah, they're full time athletes. So yeah. they don't have the kids yeah. at home and they yeah. don't have the same time constraints. They don't have other jobs to get back to. Yeah. And, and I think that's a lot issue. of it. If people yeah. know they've got like a 40 minute run to do, they're like, mm. you know, and also it's the de stress for 99% of people mm. who aren't elite athletes. They're going, they want to de, you know, some of, and uh, so they go out running and they'll feel if they just go and running really slow, they're like, that was a bit of a waste of time. It's getting yeah. changed. That, and yeah. I, and that, that's hard mm. to change, but it's also us as yeah. coaches have to have a bit of empathy to that, to be like, oh, yeah. we understand it was your fault. Your fault. That's your only time you're going to get out. You've mm. had a really crappy Zoom call, especially in the last few years when people have been like, I've got this rage that needs to, is it just me <laughs> with the rage? Oh, you <laughs> <laughs> I got this rage. A rage. Oh, uh, so I, what, I totally what would, what would what a typical saying. training week look for you, uh, look like for yeah. you, Russell? So even as I say all this, I train hard and it's not like every run is easy. You know, there are a few when I'm like, it's time for business now, which is also <laughs> quite Kenyan as well. Like yeah. I'm, I've had my easy runs, I've had that time <laughs> and now it's like time for business and I do know. So it's, it's actually really simple. It would be... Uh, when I'm in full training, I'll be like 100 miles a week minimum. So I've got that um, going on. And then track Tuesday, it's always good. It's the same in Kenya. You just know on a Tuesday evening, it's going to be quick. And then it will either be a tempo on a Thursday or just because of park run, just because I love park run so much. Yeah. I'll just move that on to Saturday morning. And then if I do that on the Saturday morning, then it's a long run on Sunday. And I just know that Sunday long run is going to be slightly easier. If the tempo goes on Thursday, then I can have a bit more um, speed going into the long run on the Sunday. Um, the only major difference with that road running um, kind of schedule is that I'm going to train for a paddy. There'll be a, a long mountain run on the weekend. And if that's going on, then it, that probably replaces the tempo. There's no... There's no um, long run on the road that I can do that exhausts me as much as a you know, long run on the mountains. You can yeah. really smash yourself. You know, I've never found a way to run up a hill easy. <laughs> like it, it, always, <laughs> it always feels hard. You, know, you can't just do that within yourself. You're always blowing out your ears. 
So I just have to be aware of that. The amount in miles, I always count them to double. I find it's the equation that works for me that almost double the road mile. Like I can quite easily run like a six minute mile on the roads and that could easily be a 12 minute mile. On yeah. The so with the same heart rate, the same amount of effort or slower, you know, so you just have to be aware of that fact. I did get into trouble early on uh, when we first moved here, trying to get into mountain running. And I was like, I'm just going to do 100 miles a week. Or say I, the same way I did on the road. That I'm was my that next question. Was yeah. How have you balanced the climbing yeah. and the miles? So it's definitely less, um, yeah, less miles if you're on the mountains. Do you track the elevation metrics too? I know you mentioned 100 miles. No, not so much. No, I'm, I haven't done that yet. Yeah, it just it still doesn't really make sense to me when people say this distance and this elevation. But, you know, the... So, like, like, if I say in Snowdonia, I can run up and down Shabod all day long. It's a lovely gradient. But if it's Triven, um, it's it's a nightmare, you know, and it's the same elevation, but it's just a lot harder to get up and down. It doesn't tell the full story. It doesn't no. tell the picture. Yeah. <laughs> so I almost don't even bother with it because it just it doesn't tell me what, you know, what I need to know. It's kind of like how, how intense that run is and how hard that run is and the elevation. Is this a small part of it? It's you know, more to the gradient, and then if it's rocks or if it's grass or if it's bogs or if it's firm, stuff like that. So no, this is a quick answer, Gary. It's all about the feel. It's all yeah, about- trying to get more into that feel. Yeah, just okay. You know that run felt hard. So probably tomorrow I'm gonna be on the sofa a bit more. You know when. I've got certain like gradient, like different hills around me that I'm like, Mm. when I'm fit, I can go up that as like a warm up and get to the top and be like, okay, do the session. And where I am right now, that is my session, that hill. Yeah. Yeah. And that's kind of how I judge it rather (laughs) than like the pace or whatever. I'm like, okay, when I can jog up this without, you know, without it feeling like too much and and carry on, I'm I'm quite fit there. It's sort of like changes throughout the season. Yeah, you're, yeah, totally right, Eddie. Yeah, there's a hill just around the back of me here. And if I can run the whole way up it without stopping to water, no, I'm in good Good to go. I I love using stuff like that. I feel quite in touch with my and never been to Kenya. Yeah. When I'm like, I feel that's quite mountainous if you're- That's exactly what we're looking for. Yeah, I'd be a big fan of that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I'd love to ask some questions now, Russell, about Dragon's Back. Um, how it panned out. I'm just going to let you talk about it. Actually, I'm not even going to ask you questions because um, f- you're you're a great chatter. Just tell yeah. us. Just tell yeah. us all about yeah. how it came about. You entered, how yeah. you trained for it, and how it panned out. Okay, got it. Right. So the um, the time I entered was uh, January 2021, and we we went straight out of the non-Christmas that happens as we remember into lockdown. And it was that was a very tough time. Low, for me. low I was time. Struggling, yeah. And um, Nina had a job, and I was homeschooling. And I've, you know, I've worked as a builder before. I've done some pretty tough jobs, and that was, this is harder, like homeschooling. How old are your kids, Russell? So they were six and four, and they're now seven and five. And it's for long, you know. Like I couldn't go for a week. A single time in months without a kid banging on the door or walking in. <laughs> they're, or they're that age. They're incapable of doing anything. anything. If you then, move, if you move or show slight interest in anything else, they're like no, they're gone. You've lost be, them. Yeah, oh right. God. And so I was going through that, and you know, Nina's my wife's amazing, and she was doing what she could, but she was the one going to work at that time. So it was me from eight till four or four thirty with the kids. You know, every day. And we have beautiful summers here, but the winters are black and rainy and dark, and we weren't allowed to travel for exercise. Yeah. Oh, I was struggling. So I needed something, anything, you know, just to hold on to, just to believe in, like some adventure. Dragon's Back is not cheap, and you know, we're not made of money. Um, so I had to put it past Nina. And she originally was not too keen on it, you know, the outlay and... Um, I, uh, I'd never done anything like that before. So, you, know, you, you might just make it one day and then quit. And then that's a lot of money. You know, the most a, expensive. Yeah, 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 right, exactly. And that happens a lot in the Dragon's Back. Um, 
So it's a bit convincing. And I just, uh, I just, I think she just saw in my eyes I needed something to hang on to. And so she accepted and then in the end got behind it. And that really helped me get through the year. You know, um, things got easier. We moved into spring. And uh, I had this, this dragon that kind of looming over me, it, you know, crept up so quick. Uh, I hadn't actually done any training specifically for it. I was training then again for the, the Paddy Buckley, but I was I was really excited about it. I didn't yeah. put it out on my social media. I didn't. I told only a very few people because right up to the day, I was really scared. I was just going to do one day and then bomb day two. I've never done a day two in my life. So I had no idea what day two was going to be. So there was that unknown, that fear element. It was, you know, really exciting as well. It was an adventure. And so, yeah, like right up to the week before the race, I pack all the stuff and get, you know, all the sourcing done. And it's, you know, quite a specific kit list that you need. You know, like you need the right kind of blades yeah. for, your, um, for your blisters and all of that stuff. I, I mean, in a way frustrating, but in a way, it was exactly what I needed, you know, something to, to take my mind off the fact there weren't a lot of races going on and I was, yeah, I was not having the best time. I hadn't, you know, been really... Uh, You're fully, struggling with seven-year-old uh, maths, you know. Yeah, oh know. man, yeah. And <clears throat> my maths was terrible anyway, at least. <laughs> like, I don't know, four plus four is two. I don't know, I don't know what she's asking there. Just write anything. Yeah. Just yeah, yeah. Oh. yeah, exactly. Every day was just a struggle not to just put them in front of a laptop and then just go to bed, you know. <laughs> like it's done, done with the whole thing. So it, it, you know that that was how it came about, and um, and it really delivered on that front. You know, it really gave me a big adventure to dream about and to get my teeth into. And I can't remember all the facets to your question now. I've gone tell us so about long. tell us about how the race unfolded. Oh wow! Okay, so day one was the day when I had my only tactic, and it was not to run away from anyone at any point. <laughs> Because it's day one. It's presuming, I mean, your foot speed was going to be mm. above everybody there, but perhaps your mountain skills and experience was, um, you, well, you just hadn't had time in the mountains, I presume. No, Eddie. Um, I had, because I had been training for the paddy, and uh, it went exactly over day one, the paddy buckley. I did a lot of the okay, same. Okay, so you were thinking I... So I was in one. great shape and yeah. I was really ready to roll on day one and I held myself right back. And I would... There is a part of um, the Paddy Buckley where I would practice what I like to call hyper-aware, which is a technique I got off some you know, motivational speaker podcast or whatever. Uh, and I think it was an American football coach, quite a high-up guy. I try and listen to, you know, all different sports. And it was just about just cutting out distractions and getting in your zone. And so from kind of David to kind of Llewellyn, I would always switch off the music, not fidget, not touch my kit, not look at the beautiful scenery, just yeah. think of some, focus on the next you know, few steps ahead of me, focus on my breathing. You know, always practice it from kind of David to kind of Llewellyn. And I would do that in my recce zone on the um, Paddy Buckley. And then we went, that exact same course on the dragon's back. And I floated away from Kim Collison and Simon Roberts. Kim Collison is, you know, a, a probably world-class uh, long distance mountain climber. Yeah. And he has the Paddy Buckley overall speed record. And Simon Roberts is the guy that ended up winning it. But um, there was a lot of stuff that was coming up to be really useful for day one. But that was still the same day when I was like, no, no breaking away. From anyone. Uh, I didn't know who Simon Roberts was, and uh, to be fair to him, he didn't know who I was either. Kim Collison fell back on Trivan and then later on dropped out. The other guy, Marcus Scottney, who's a previous winner, yeah. he dropped out. Um, Steve Birkinshaw is a previous winner, he dropped out. It was a hot day, a lot of people dropping. Um, but my only tactic was, you know, don't run off with this because this day two, day three, day four. Yeah. So I uh, I feel like it could have been the day when I may actually made a break 
and I would have been okay, but I just didn't know that. So that was day one. I finished with Simon, um, Simon Roberts, and then I felt, you know, I felt pretty good. Uh, day two, what actually happened was, um, because of my Paddy Buckley records and because I've got a family, I would always get up early and go for my records. Like, uh, you know, I was just used to getting up at like four or five on a weekend and just hitting, hitting the road, you know, getting out on the hills. Um, and then when the dragons back, what they were trying to do was handicap us so that quicker guys go at eight and the stuff okay. so it's, And I just wasn't up for that at all. And I found out <laughs> it, it wasn't mandatory. So I was out, out of the gate at six in the morning. Um, and so pretty early on, I was out in front. But it did work out well at all. In fact, it worked out disastrously day two for me because uh, it's the Rinogiv, which is a mountain range that is not in the Paddy Buckley. So I hadn't wrecked very much at all. And it's rough. It's the roughest terrain in the Dragon's Back. And it's the roughest terrain in the whole of the they're a very small choice, you know, tiny little sheep choice. And if you miss them by 10 meters, yeah, packing through heather and brambles, and you just slow down dramatically. And on top of that, it was 30 degree heat. And I just didn't know where I was going. I was taking slow lines. I was getting demoralized. I was going the wrong way and coming back. And, you know, every time you do that, you just, you hate yourself, you know, <laughs> you just start beating yourself up. And you saw you guys got lost. And, correcting yourself it's just going on and on and on it was like a, a long day and it was hot and i um i've made a mistake there tactically you know i would have been better off setting setting off with simon yeah uh, but i always you know i backed myself i wanted to go out early and go out hard and it didn't transpire that way and it simon took out nearly an hour out of me that day and i never got that back you know that was that was um that was a long it was a big period um and simon had done the race before so he had that experience and he wrecked the hell out of the course yeah. and i hadn't and he was really good he was excellent at taking care of business you know he was fueling well he was really good at running safely so he didn't you know twist his ankle he yeah. didn't get lost he didn't get injured and that stuff was kind of really what after you've lost an hour, you really need something big like that to happen. So it's like, yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just leave the bar. You don't need to eat, Simon. You I know. Yeah, yeah. Just have a few more pints. <laughs> I'll buy. Um, <laughs> so yeah, he he just kept uh, taking care of business every day after that. And and that was what I was doing. And I wasn't good enough to make an hour's difference. And in fact, he increased that lead over the course of the next four days. It was beautiful running and it was a beautiful experience and I do not regret a single part. You know, I'm friends with Simon now and he's actually um, been doing the spine race this weekend and we've been chatting about that. And I would have much rather that, you know, where I got pushed to my limit by somebody else than if, I don't know, it would have been Kim Collison and he dropped out and it was me on my own. Yeah. yeah that's when the Venus is exciting. So every night I was going to bed like, how do I? beat this guy what can i do you know, it was you know it was a real it was a real adventure a real experience and uh you know i'm a big fan of the tour de france obviously it's riddled with drugs but um the way that it's you know a, a, a war of attrition that goes on and that's what was going on with the dragon's back and i think the dot watching is more exciting when it's okay it's not just one day it's you know yeah. how do you deal with the recovery and how you deal with camp life you know it's, it's not a picnic either uh, and then see how how they're reacting to that and getting on the next day and stuff you know and people said that you know that they, that the whole week was just taken over by just getting sucked into a screen and following this little dot around we've all got the spine at the moment haven't we that's a lot yeah, yeah. we've got dougie's in this though i think fourth so don't take your eye off dougie it's a long way to go yes you did a double Bob Graham round record? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. That's That would be a good bit of training for that. Yeah, thing. yeah. Yeah. So it's not it's, Yeah, no, really exciting. Yeah, and I have been dot watching, but I uh, just not obviously this morning. How was your, I'm really curious, you said about um, Simon really looked after himself with the nutrition. Am I right in thinking that you've struggled with that in the past? Um, stomach issues. How was your nutrition over the Dragon's Back? Yeah, Gary. So that has been a 
big learning curve for me. So with these long distance things, you know, I'm I'm such a purist. I come from like uh, running, with, you know, as close to naked as possible. I just want to be that guy in the savanna, you know, in like a loincloth, barefoot, you know, with a <laughs> spear. That's where that's my like yeah. dream, you know. And uh, anything on top of that, I'm like, oh god, do I have to carry this? Oh, I hate how it's. <laughs> oh my god, stuff. you're like my kids. It's so really? heavy. Yeah, I know. Oh, just, just <laughs> throw me down. You know, and if you run on track, like that is still what it's like. You want everything off you. Like you want. Yeah. You know, a lot of track runners are literally shaving the hair off themselves. You know, just to feel more, you know, aerodynamic <laughs> and like I didn't go that far. But yeah, so gel is just another part of that, like something that was not running that I had to think about. Oh, oh God, you know, so I came on to it really reluctantly. And I've run marathons and, you know, you need to take one gel or half an hour. It's not that bad, you know, it's not that much to think about. And I could pretty much do that. But yeah, when I started wrecking the Paddy Buckley, I realized that this is actually essential. And I boiled it down to, you know, once you've got a heart and lungs that are fit, it's yeah. nutrition and it's and it's um, psychology, you know, it's the mentors. And I was, my gut, it, it takes a while to train. Like it's, you know, it's not a muscle, but it's an organ. It's a, it's mm. a living thing inside your body and it, and it needs training the same as any other part of your body, the same as your heart and lungs. And then, so I was just having a lot of trouble, just throwing up, or just not feeling like eating, or bonking all over the place. But yeah, mainly with the uh, Paddy Buckley, I, I figured a lot of stuff out, you know, what works for me and what doesn't. And with the Dragon's Back, there are, there are levels that I found. I've got two levels where either I'm like cruising and I can take on salty food and I can yeah. take on crisps and pizza. And, and then if I'm going fast, like into that, that lactic threshold range, yeah. it's... It's just simple, simple carbs, you know, gels and bars. It's quite common, isn't it? I think people do struggle then when they get to that lactic mm. yeah, that threshold effort with the with the digestion system. Mm. I wonder if that was it. Yes, so that's definitely something I've found. And, and, you know, and I'm starting to train it to be able to, you know, take on a bit more salty food at that level, but it's still also just accepting. And I heard from um, Beth Pascal, who's a friend of the show. Yeah. <laughs> um, she just doesn't even bother trying, does she? You know, I'm not even going to go with the fatty foods, just get yeah. the gels in and just keep going with that. And that's something that I have learned the hard way. I did the winter paddy um, end of 2020, and I think I had 40 gels. I literally Ooh. had 40 gels. It's beat my um, record. That's... Is that your record? Oh, well, no, I mean... that's beaten my record. I've not, I've 28 is my record. Yeah, and I, and I got home, and I didn't eat another sweet thing for, like, Four months. It Probably didn't have a dentist bit. appointment. I, mean, I washed the hell out of my teeth. Yeah, I <laughs> washed my teeth hard. <laughs> yeah, because that's the other problem. Yeah, it's just sweet stuff. So, but it, it does work uh, and it's worked for me. And um, Simon Roberts actually gave me a room bar when he was at the Dragon's Back because I dropped the gel. Uh, story is actually that we were coming in just before Breck and Beacons and there was a burger. Store. And I was like, oh, I could do a can of Coke and a burger, you know, and I'll buy. And he's like, oh, no, 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 there's a better one just down the road. Oh, and of class. course, there wasn't. Oh, I, I would not have trusted that. Yeah. Raging, Eddie. Raging. Rage. Rage. Oh, oh, rage I was that. sad. I was, I was disappointed in him. It was a tactic. He set you up. Definitely set me up there. And I, told, <laughs> and I told him that as well. We had and he little... said, have this boom bar. And you yeah. were like, <laughs> yeah, I was like, threw it back in his face. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take your food bar. I'm going back to the burger store. Anyway, I had the room bar and it's actually, I did genuinely like it. I was like, oh, okay, it's not as terrible as a gel, you know, because it's chewy, it's something to get your teeth into. Yeah. And so, uh, yeah, that was what I used in this latest winter Paddy Bucky because they're just a little bit more substantial, less sickly. Yeah. And also, you just don't get the shit all over your hands. You know? this oh, yeah. goodness me, the, the gel. Worst thing. I've never I managed. I love that. To. I love getting oh. deep and dirty oh, with it and being like yeah. just covered. It's all over yeah. me vest and everything. Oh, I like it's... it everywhere. It's uh, all over your hands. It's all on your vest. You're like, I'm in it now. Now that I'm in it. Sounds I like a that. weird kind of 
That's it, Sadie. It's <laughs> definitely gel, not you, into that. You, you oh. it and it's everywhere. And then you oh. leave your pack and you don't unpack it. And then, I like, the like next, or even if you've done a race like a week later, you're like, oh, no. yeah, it's no, all dried no. and it's all sticky. Yeah. <laughs> it's not good no, at all. Just... much Russell for that interview loved it we love it can't wait for the next installment uh go if you can't get enough of Russell go and follow him on Instagram Russell Bentley he is actually quite funny and he's real which I always like I, in fact that's why I actually asked him to be on the podcast I'm I was like, a bit shocked there. you know when I've seen his Instagram and Facebook he was short hair and clean shaven but then when he was on the zoom he had lots of hair going on I was jealous <laughs> do you know what Gary I don't know do you know how many cheer charge seeds are in a cheer charge bar? Oh, wow. I've been thinking about this, actually. Funny you well, there's so many in my teeth. There's definitely five in my teeth right now. <laughs> Go on then, tell me. Spill the beans. Well, I don't, I don't actually have the answer, but ah. Tim told me that you get 100 milligrams of omega-3 from, from the cheer charge seeds in one large flapjack, which I've just eaten. So that's why my brain is like incredible right now because my omega threes are really okay. counting he said he said he did try to count how many were in a gram once but he couldn't do it and so he's going to try again so i'm going to ask him come on yeah oh if anyone's got you know they're on a bit of isolation kids at home with covid smash up a bar count out yeah. the seats for us and let us know we'll make sure that you get repaid that's your homework nice. <laughs> yeah. oh we've got a couple of races we've got loads of races coming up actually but we picked out two and one that popped up on my radar was the box hill fell race i remember box hill i used to live in that part of the world and it was a bit of a mecca i remember for cyclists um for motorcyclists and for just kind of people out on their cars and i it, when i saw it on the list of i think si entries i thought oh we'll give that a shout out because i'd cycled up there twice on my zwift race the other day so <laughs> <laughs> I used to cycle up at loads when we used to live in London and I used to do a race called the Ball Buster, which right. was an eight mile lap and you ran around and up Box Hill and then you got on your bike and I think you did it twice, maybe three times and then yeah. you popped the bike at the top of Box Hill and then you did the lap again. 12k and 521 meters. Nice, nice and spicy. What's the other one you found for me? The Peddler's, isn't it Peddler's Way or Peddler's Way? Well, I copied and pasted it, so I think it is Peddler's Way. Peddler's Way runs from the Ultra. Suffolk border to the North Norfolk coast. Oh, all very runnable even in the winter, and navigation is easy. Following the National Trail, total distance just over 48 miles. That's a nice little winter one, isn't it? Where you know you're not going to be bogged down. Yeah. Nice views. Could be a bit claggy in the. Uh, in the mist maybe it sounds really inclusive you know if it's runnable easy nav and yeah i'm not going to say 48 miles is a long way to go but it's not 268 miles it's um it sounds great fingers crossed the weather's all right gary not only am i giving you cheer charge facts galore this episode you'll never get another thing another five-star review not just any five-star review one all the way from australia isn't that phenomenal, people? Oh, I, I still pinch oh, myself. I knew we would go international. I knew it was just a matter of time before people realised that this <laughs> this was the place to be. Have you ever been to Australia? Oh, yeah. I've been there once, but for a long time. Did you go? Yeah, six months I lived there for. Oh, this is every, every time I learned. Did you, uh, did you work? Did you travel? I we travelled, yeah. We <laughs> I've actually, a bit shady about it. <laughs> what went on? What went on down under? We um landed in Darwin and I thought Darwin would be like a, it probably is now, it was quite a long time since I was there. But I thought Darwin would be massive, like this big city, the capital of the north. Let's say it wasn't what we expected. <laughs> <laughs> it, the, yeah it just was like a little small town but yeah if you like crocodiles and stuff like that darwin is the place to go it's put some epic uh national parks but yeah we made our way all the way down australia went to the middle alice uh springs all that kind of stuff did a had the did the classic stuff had you know hide a van did fruit picking to pay for our uh journey yeah it was great got really severely sunburnt um <laughs> picking tomatoes i think it was and grapes is it, is, and... It is it a country you go back to is it a country you look like you would move to yes i know i really love the outdoor lifestyle 
everything about the place was phenomenal. As a Brit, it was just too far away. Um, yeah, this is it's a long way. It's a long way, isn't it? And I, I'm quite a positive person, but it was the uh, Christmas was a real struggle in Australia for me. I think I had a turkey bagel. That was my Christmas dinner. It was like red hot. And in, we were in Brisbane. And in Brisbane, at least they did then, they uh, made like a little beach on the river. So and people would go to the beach uh, in Brisbane uh, at Christmas Day. And it was wonderful. But I just wanted a bit of family out there, which was okay. which was uh, not going to happen. But yeah, wonderful place. I would go back there in a heartbeat. We've got friends out there still. It's just too far. It's purely it. Yeah, I could quite easily live there. I could quite easily live in Finland, New Zealand. <laughs> Lots of great places. Oh, no, <laughs> Someone just pay for my flights. Right, you read, you read, do you want to read the review? Shall I read the review? I really don't mind. I'm not precious. Do you, are you going to do the uh, Australian accent? I absolutely <laughs> love Under the Hills. Being in Australia, I had to Google Fells and Clegg when I first started listening. <laughs> But now it's the podcast I look forward to in each week. I can't keep it up. I can't. <laughs> was it quite good? I thought it was quite good. I closed my eyes. Really I was there. Gary and Eddie have such a wonderful reporter and fantastic interviewers. Oh, that's, that's very kind. Oh, I've learned so much from them, along with their varied and interesting guest. I actually enjoy the banter before and after the interview most. Yay. Thank you so much, Eddie and Gary, for all they do. Oh, and a thank you at the end oh that's kind thanks jody from australia uh keep listening keep spreading the word out there in us for us sorry about the accent don't take offense don't stop listening that was a gift thank you that accent there it's wonderful we <laughs> talked about being um grateful and your ability to just hone in on an accent it could be regional or i mean it could be any accent it just trips off <laughs> so natural <laughs> yeah thanks jody that was very kind of very generous of you to leave that review thanks very much Competition time. We need some help, guys. We are flat out busy. Gary's suffering from nervous anxiety from everything that he's got to do. So we need some help. And um, we're going to ask you. And in return, you're not going to get paid, but you are, could be a competition winner of some cheer charge goodies. Or, and you could hear your question uh, read out on the podcast. So at the end of each interview, as you all know, we give our quick fire questions. Gary's much better at coming up with them than I am um but uh we've got tons of interviews lined up for the next uh six weeks or so so we want some good ones we want some um funny ones some, sometimes we get into like a whole new conversation from them as well yeah. we love new things and sometimes also it's when the guest really opens up and they sort of step away from their media crew oh, and let's into the deep side of the interview so uh i thought we'd let you a couple of our favorites mine always two things that tell me whether the guest would be my bff cat or dog you all know the answer to that coffee or tea we all know the answer to that i mean maybe i should ask that at the beginning of the interview and then i could decide whether i stay in the zoom call or that I just... could be like a little icebreaker couldn't it <laughs> ease us in cat or dog but then if they say cat and coffee i'm kind of gonna not really want to engage just with them. like where do we go from the call off <laughs> <laughs> wi-fi's gone we're out <laughs> yeah what, fine, what, what, what have been uh, a couple of your favorites gary well, I always like the pity party <clears throat> or I'm going to say man up, but we shouldn't really say man up, should we? Say zip it up, suck it up. Zip it up. So I always go man up. As I kind of think <laughs> man is a word that you would kind of like, not in describing a man as in the man, I more like, come on. Come on. And Strong. I always like the calm driver or the road ranger, I think. Who was it? Well, who did we ask that one to? And someone was Leash. like, and we thought they'd say calm or something. And then she was like, oh, no, I get terrible road ranger. <laughs> But yeah, I really like that. Um, coffee and tea, that's always a favorite. And I really, the last song someone listens to, I just, uh, that is a bit People a bit struggle with that as well. Sometimes people are a bit shifty because they're like, oh, I don't want to go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm going to pop a post on Facebook on Friday um, and uh, I'll put in this uh, bit of hilarious band we've had about it and just pop in your quick fire quite if you've got a couple you can put as many as you want if you've got loads go on yeah put them in we will choose the winner on uh first of february so you've got two weeks till the deadline so whew, full on show gary couldn't yeah, need a spur from a tea before we carry on Have you, you tell me what, chat what, what you tell me what you've got coming up and i'll drink my tea while i listen well You'll all be amazed to know. Oh, no, I've just seen no more 200 and 400. <laughs> still doing them. We oh, are increasing, though. Every It started up at six. 
It does them differently, actually. So it basically does, uh, first time we did them, it was six, 400, like a 400, 200 sandwich. Then it was eight. And now this week it's 10. I think get access to a track. Oh, one. but I think a track is hard on the body. I think almost you're better staying off the track with, okay. uh, with the aged body. Oh, yeah. The other session is quite a big one, actually. So it's 200s to do some 200s. And then it's uh, three mile at threshold pace one minute recovery and then two mile at threshold pace and then finishing off with some 200s I'm not too sure where i'm going to do that actually um and how that fits in with the week but that is on the plan whether i do it or not i might swap that one for a little zwifty little zwifty um yeah session. you could do like you could do like uh you do like 20 minutes or 15 minutes steady yeah couple of minutes recovery, 10 12 four and then finish with some like power sprints yeah so i'll have a look see what maybe uh see what the weather's like but have a look on zwift see what workouts they've got hoping to get over to the lakes on saturday our friends doing the amble side to coniston official recce um so i'm gonna jump in with him hopefully and i'm trying to tempt him into stay in the night in the grassmere wire chair last time i checked there was a room spare so we could have two you big days love a YHA night. yeah 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 but i will be doing the I won't be doing the recce. I was going to do maybe a Fairfield out and back. Yeah, that that's a kind of um, if you've run that route, you've run that route so many times. Yeah, I don't I don't need to do the recce and the elevation Fairfield. I think it's about nine hundred meters, um, something like that. So quite good, quite good. Can't be nine hundred meters. Not beside that. Anyway, it's going to be more elevation than running to Coniston from Ambleside, I think. That's me. That's me. What about yourself? I'm just going to live for another week, Gary. I'm going to, as Coach said earlier, <laughs> let's just try and put some sessions together, Eddie. Let's try and do some proper sessions, get the week together, catch up on general life admin that has been, well, pay my blimmin' taxes, which I've been every, I'm going to do it tonight. Boring. Every night, I'm like, too boring. <laughs> and do you do that? with the jobs you write the list and the jobs you don't you do all yeah and then there's three or four jobs that you're like oh just God. and they only take like two minutes i've yeah. done all my accounts i'm just like i just hate doing i just like just do it and like just like no i watch netflix <laughs> <laughs> so i'm gonna do my little bits on my to-do list i've been putting off and just tick off the sessions and i'm just trying to be as i said right at the beginning hours ago i'm just trying to do you know going hard enough for a training benefit but also just holding back so i can actually just go consistent and actually yeah. build this flipping base uh, otherwise it's going to get into march and i'm still going to be whining if you're enjoying the show please like share subscribe and follow subscribing to the show really is the best way for us to grow and become even more internationally acknowledged than we already are that was episode 73 Thanks for listening. Thanks for any five-star reviews. And thanks again for Cheer Charge for sponsoring the show. I'm Eddie Sutton. And I'm Gary Thwaites. And let's run to the hills. Mm -hmm.